Hi, thank you all so much for coming uh, today to celebrate the 15 years of the Children's Environmental Health, uh, Research Centers and all the difference they've made in kids' lives. Um, I'm the moderator. My name's Ramona Travato. I'm the Associate Assistant Administrator in the Office of Research and Development at the Environmental Protection Agency. But back when we started these centers, I was the Director of the Office of Children's Health Protection at EPA, and I got to help set these up. So for me, this is a... Um, doubly wonderful because I was there at the beginning and now in, in the Office of Research and Development, 15 years later, I'm, I still get to play in this really, really important work. And uh, I want to thank all of you who have continued this important research over the years. I also want to be um, to thank um, Senator Gillibrand and her staff for making this possible. It's not easy to pull all, you, all, all these folks together, um, to get space here, to um, partner with others to make this happen. And um, is any of Senator Gillibrand's staff here so we can thank you personally? Nobody right now? Okay, well, we'll make sure that they know how much we appreciate their work. Um, EPA and NIH worked hard uh, along with Senator Gillibrand's staff and those of our co-sponsors to make this possible. Um, we, starting with the friends of the NIEHS, and Walla Moore was very instrumental in this. She couldn't be here today, but I wanted to make sure we thanked her for all, the, all her hard work. Um, Sarah Buchanan is here today representing friends of the NIEHS. Could you wave, Sarah? Thank you very much. And um, there are five other co-sponsoring organizations that I'd like to recognize. The American Academy of Pediatrics, who has been instrumental very instrumental over many years in considering environmental health. And they, in fact, helped us to move the whole concept of environmental health forward back when we were first thinking about it for kids' health. They were very active in the beginning when all these ideas about kids' health and kids' environmental health were being established. The Children's Environmental Health Network, Carol's here today from, um, from the Children's Environmental Health Network. In fact, it was at a 1994 symposium of the Children's Environmental Health Network that the first idea of having these um, Children's Environmental Health Research Centers was hatched. And I think Kara, it was actually Carol's idea. So um, here, here. <laughs> And uh, the Children's Environmental Health Network at the time was, uh, and continuing even today, had a very um, uh, starstruck cast of folks. I mean, it had Phil Landrigan, um, uh, Dick Jackson, I think, Ricky, were you, were you there in the beginning too, I believe? And, and many, many other folks were there who were terrific. And uh, they helped to get this whole idea going. The National Center for Environmental Health Strategies was, is one of the co-sponsors. Who's here from that? Anybody? today. Well, we thank them as well. And uh, finally, the Society for Occupational and Environmental Health. Anybody here from there? Thank you very much. And the Trust for America's Health. Anybody? Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I would also like to thank the co-sponsors for our lovely refreshments in the back because, uh, you know, the government doesn't do that anymore. And so <laughs> we're very, very grateful. Um, the partnership between EPA and NIEHS over these last 15 years has been phenomenal. Uh, and it's, it's government at its, at its best, in my opinion. We partner. We partner around our strengths. We make sure that together we do the best job possible. Back when this all started, EPA didn't do centers. NIEHS did do centers. That partnership brought EPA into the idea of doing those centers, and because of the work NIEHS had already done, we were confident that this would work. We didn't do this community outreach as part of the whole translation of research, and I think that came from NIEHS as well, and I have to say that that has been a brilliant and powerful part of translating this research into action quickly, which is really what you want the government's money to do. You want it to make a difference as soon as it can make a difference. And that's part of what these centers do. And that's a really important part of what these centers do. So I know Linda will talk a whole lot more about the NIEHS role and our, um, and our, our investigators will talk about what they found along the way. But I would just like to say there's a number of, I'll mention a couple of, of activities that have been undertaken by our principal investigators that have changed kids' lives. And then I'm going to turn it over to the stars of our show to, to talk about the details. Um, the children's centers at UC Berkeley 
directed by Brenda Eskenazi, who's one of our speecher, speakers, and the University of Washington Children's Center in Seattle, directed by Elaine Faustman, have been working on pesticide exposures to kids, and especially migrant farm worker kids. And they looked at the take-home pathway, and it's as simple as where are those pesticides coming from that those kids are exposed to? It's in their clothes of their parents who are coming home. So they found a way to help those kids in real time right now. That's what these centers are all about. And they translated that into the community, and they're making a difference now. The Children's Center at the University of Southern California found that kids living near roadways, that is within 80 yards of roadways, were significantly more likely to have asthma than other kids. That's a big finding. Now the question is, what do we do about that? How do we make a difference? How do we move ahead? Many of the centers have found, uh, have learned a lot from their work, and that work is translated not only into changes in the federal government's activities, but also into changes in state and local activities. So once again, it's another way that the centers make a difference. They make a difference in their communities. They make a difference through changes in policies, procedures, regulations at local, state, and federal levels. So it's really, really important. They have, regular, they have policy impacts. This research is making a difference. Children are 30 percent of our population and 100 percent of our future. They deserve to be treated well. They deserve every chance in life. And if we can't do it in this great country of the United States of America, where can we do it? NIEHS is a public health agency. EPA is a public health agency. We focus on the health of our, of our citizens. And focusing on our youngest is a way to focus on our future. So with that, I am going to turn this over to Linda, who if she wants to come on up, that would be great. And Dr. Linda Birnbaum is, let, let me say first, we have to claim her. She's formerly with EPA, and we love that. And now she is the director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences of the National Institutes of Health and the National Toxicology Program. She's a board-certified toxicologist, has 35, 34 years' experience as a federal scientist, spent 19 years with EPA, and she was elected. This is a big deal. She was elected to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies in 2010 and has too many awards for me to ever possibly list. So I am just going to turn it over to her and let her tell her story. Thanks a lot, Linda. Let's give her a big hand. So thank you, Ramona. Um, I have to say, this is really a celebration that we're having here, about 15 years of our Children's Environmental Health Centers. But I want you to know that when we go back in time, in fact, NIEHS commitment to children's health goes back to our very founding as a division at NIH in 1966. And in 1974, we actually funded the Harvard Six City Studies, where we were looking at the effects of um, air pollution, especially particulate air pollution, on children's health. And at that point, we showed how not only did PM cause more respiratory problems in the kids, but the deficits that were induced in lung function persisted into adulthood. Now, in addition, as we go forward here, we, so we held actually our first research workshop on children's environmental health issues in 1993, around the time that we began to talk to EPA about what could we do to work together in this issue, which was really stimulated by President Clinton's executive order in 1997, where he said it was absolutely essential that we protect children from environmental health risks. And we were able to get the centers off the ground in 1998, and it's been a great partnership um, really ever since. Um, and I think the important thing as we go forward is that, you know, these centers have continued. So. We actually have six centers that, um, well, four centers that were in existence in the, the original group that are still in existence with some of the same PIs today. And we have several other centers that we've had some new people enter the group as PIs, but they're also still in existence. And today, there are 14 funded centers in FY13 that were funded this no, it's FY14 now, guys, um, that were funded through FY13 um, this year. And I think that that is really great news. And we look forward to continued funding of this absolutely critical program. And I think one of the things Ramona mentioned is about the beauty of centers is that we, they're multidisciplinary. We bring all the actors together. We have the basic science. We have the translational science. And we have the communities all working together to improve the health of our children. 
Now, as I mentioned, NIEHS has a long history, going back to 1966 when we were, were first started, looking at issue of children's environmental health. And actually, we are funding, in addition to the, for example, this year we spent $13 million in FY13 on the children's centers um, and then partnered that with the EPA dollars. But in addition, we're spending actually in FY12, we spent $112 million on children's health research. And this kind of really neat graphic just gives you an idea of where the focus is. So you can see that neurological outcomes in children is a major concern I think that the population has when we all look at the skyrocketing of autism spectrum disorders, of ADHD, um, of neurological problems, I think we understand why we're putting so much of an investment in that area. But then also issues of, for example, respiratory outcomes and reproductive outcomes. And then some newer areas that are oh, cancer outcomes. One of our Berkeley centers focused on childhood leukemia and the environmental predictors of childhood leukemia. Um, and we have other work going on there. But a lot of general kind of work with some new areas that are just coming in. For example, issues about the microbiome, which interacts with the environment all the time. And we know that children who are born vaginally um, have a different microbiome than children who are born by C-section. And what does that mean for their long-term health? Well, we really don't know. But it's something that we have to begin to look at. What about, for example, the whole metabolic outcomes? We're beginning to know, for example, that there are things called obesogens, and I'm not giving you a buy, you still have to exercise, you still have to watch your diet, but are we setting people up to fail because of early life exposures to certain chemicals that we have clear evidence from animal studies and growing evidence from epidemiology studies are making, are, are helping you on the way to obesity. So those kinds of things are really very important and exciting. Um, I now really want to switch to some of the focus on the children's centers and under, you know, just go over briefly what some of the goals of the children's centers are, and we really want to understand what are the environmental factors that affect our, our health, and why do we want to understand that? Because you can't change your genes, but you can change your environment. And if we can prevent disease from environmental exposure, much better than having to, to treat or to try to cure it. So we're also trying to, as I... When I talk about prevention, then really that's how we're moving into the translation, into real-world solutions um, that we can deal with related to environmentally mediated um, diseases or disorders. We have established a national research network. I'm going to show you the slides, but there's also the map in the back showing you where all the children's environmental health centers are today. And I already stressed the importance of multidisciplinary research um, opportunities. You can't do environmental health research without two things. First of all, you have to begin to gather people from very many different kinds of disciplines to deal with the complexity of environmental health. The second thing is, is you have to work with the communities. You cannot do environmental health research without working with the communities to understand what are their concerns, get them involved, so that they can help make changes in their lives um, as well. So some of the research challenges that we're focusing on now, I think we all know children are not little adults. I mean, we should all know that anyway. We know teenagers are certainly not little adults. Um, but, <laughs> but, but we also know that children are at greater risk for two reasons. One, their bodies are rapidly changing and developing, which in fact means that they are at points in their lives when it's easy to impact, easy to cause a problem. If you cause a problem during development, it's not going to go away. It's going to be something that you live with for the rest of your life. So in fact, it affects all of us and all of our futures, what happens to our children. And then the other thing is children's behavior is a little different than most adults. I mean, most of us don't crawl on the floor all the time. We're not, there are plenty of us looking around who have their hands near their mouths, but most of us don't have them in our mouth all the time, and we're not constantly putting, you know, every little blankie and bunny and so on in our mouth like children do. So we know that in general, and also because children are small, they actually eat and drink and inhale more per body weight than adults do. So children are also exposed more to environmental compounds than are adults. So both because inherent sensitivity, because of the rapid growth, and because of exposure. Then another thing we know is that, in fact, for quite a number of environmental chemicals, effects are beginning to be detected in the general population. We are concerned with background exposures, low-level exposures. We're not really focused on very high kind of poisonings 
most of the time. We do have populations where poisonings are still a problem. But for much of our population, we're concerned with the chronic low-level exposures that can have an impact um, on children's growth and development. And then the third thing that I want to point is that environmental exposures are complicated. It's not one chemical. When we deal with air pollution, we kind of realize there are multiple things that we're inhaling. And we look at that, some of that as a totality. PM is a horrendously complex mixture. We, we tend to look at it as a totality. But we forget about the soup of everything else that we live in. And it's not just the chemical exposures. We forget that drugs are chemicals. We forget that what you eat is chemicals. And all these different kinds of things can interact. And we need to understand that. And we need to develop innovative approaches as we go forward to approach these difficult questions. So I want to celebrate, again, the 15 years of the, of the centers and the outstanding research. So this just gives you kind of a, a picture of the different groups that have participated in the center. And you can see that University of Washington, Brenda Ashkenazi Center at Berkeley, um, the John Hopkins Center, and Columbia, Ricky Pereira and, and Greg Diede is, um, is representing the Hopkins Center. These have been in existence since the beginning. They have been productive. We are optimistic that they will continue to be successful um, in this tight physical environment as we go forward. But in addition, we have many others that have, we've had some that have come and gone. That doesn't mean they're not going to come back. And we have others the, the kind of the uh, light blue are what we used to, well, a kind of center that we started um, in 2010, which were formative centers. They got less money, but they were to get them started. And a bunch of those have now converted to full centers, such as the one at the University of Illinois that Sue Shantz is here representing. Um, in addition, there's one center there which EPA only funded, and that was at Duke University. And the reason was is my predecessor as the director of NIEHS was a Dukey, and he was basically, and there was a, a potential conflict there so that they couldn't, um, NIEHS at the time couldn't fund that center. But that center has basically is completing its efforts, and we have a new center just funded at Duke um, to continue the children. So I think we've had a lot of exciting work um, happening, and I expect lots more work in the future. And so here's the map that is in the back wall, and this just kind of shows you the geographical representation. We're kind of throughout the country. I can see there's some big blocks, like other than Duke, uh, that's the only one in the south. Um, we don't have too many in the middle of the country. But what you can see is the, the uh, let's see, the Blue are the centers that are currently in existence, and the red are the ones that have just been funded again. Um, so you can see some of that, which I think is kind of exciting, all the different programs that we have. Now I'm just going to give a, a, a snapshot of some of the center findings, because you're going to hear from three of our, our wonderful center directors after me. Um, and I think Ramona already referred to the USC study on air pollution in children's house. Um, I think we've known for a while that living near crowded freeways is not good for anybody's health, but we're beginning to understand now that it's really bad for pregnant women and their children. And because it leads to um, elevated levels, not only of problems with their lung development, but actually asthma. And we're beginning to understand that asthma is actually usually induced related to early life exposures in utero or, or early childhood. But what's interesting here is the combination between psychosocial stress and air pollution. And so if children are in homes where there's a lot of stress going on, if the parents are stressed, they're much more likely to have asthma than if you don't have the stress. And remember, stress is a physiological response. It causes lots of different mediators in our bodies to interact with, um, with the external environment as well. And another thing that we're finding, and I'm not going to mention it here. Well, I am going to mention it because I brought it up. Um, we, we now have evidence also that living near crowded highways is associated with lower IQ in children. And there have now been two studies reported that living near heavily crowded highways is associated with an increased risk of autism spectrum disorders, um, which is, I think, among the strongest evidence we have to this point for environmental, a clear environmental signal uh, related to um, ASD. But another thing, though, that we're finding um, is, as I mentioned this, you know, the obesogen idea and the, and the fact that early life exposure may predispose you to being overweight. And it's clear evidence now that living near 
uh, high traffic areas is associated with an elevated BMI, which is a measure of basically how heavy you are um, in children um, by the age of 18. So I think, and if you look actually at the graph there on the right, uh, hey guys, I'm a scientist, I have to show a little bit of data, but what you can see is the clear relationship by the closer you are um, to a major highway, the more likelihood of an elevated BMI. So some of the, Davis, uh, some of the data I mentioned, the increase in autism spectrum disorder in our center at UC Davis has really playing a leadership role in much of the autism. They were involved in actually, they have a wonderful study called CHARGE where they have recruited hundreds of children on the autism spectrum um, disorder spectrum, um, as well as normally developed tr children, as well as children ha who have developmental delays. And they actually worked with the group at USC to map where their mothers had lived when they were pregnant um, to see that association with autism. But in some of the mechanistic studies, they're also looking at a number of different kind of environmental pollutants, not only PCBs, but for example, some of the brominated flame retardants, the PBDEs, and find that this can disrupt normal signaling within the cells. Um, and in pathways, which we know are important in terms of um, autism um, development. Now, some interesting work, and actually this not only came out of Harvard, but out of Mount, and out of our Mount Sinai Center, is a really exciting thing. Save your kids' baby teeth. They may be useful later <laughs> for, you know, for um, measurement of past exposure. Because Menashe has demonstrated actually clearly that you can see clear the enamel is laid down in your teeth kind of like on levels and, and layers. And so that you can actually, like tree rings, you can actually determine when something occurred. And there are clear changes in these enamel layers depending, for example, based upon what children were eating. So you can tell when a child switched, for example, breastfeeding to bottle feeding or bottle feeding to solid food and so on. And we're beginning um, to get this kind of a biomarker to understand what a child's exposure might have been um, in their first six years of life. Now, uh, the Dartmouth Center, and we've got representatives here, and I have to welcome Chancellor Folk from UNC, um, Chapel Hill, who was one of our grantees um, for many years at Dartmouth and is, is gracing us with her presence here. Brother Dartmouth is doing some really exciting work about with arsenic. Um, and I should say, sometimes when scientists say something's exciting, it's bad news. Um, so I should probably use different words. But the bottom line is, is arsenic is not going to go away. You know, arsenic is a natural metal. Um, we find it in lots of rocks throughout the world. We find it in water. It's, all, it's in many, many places. But we're also now finding it in a lot of our food supply. Um, and what, what the Dartmouth Group has been able to show is that rice and rice products including some of the organic rice and the, the brown rice, which we all thought was giving us lots of vitamins and minerals, um, are, le are present at levels of concern um, in our food supply. And FDA has recently uh, issued some information basically recommending to, to parents that they not give their babies, that rice cereals should not be baby's first food, um, and that, that people should have a balanced diet and not focus so extensively on rice-based products because of the levels um, of arsenic in the food. Now, lead is another natural metal, not going to go away. We know that levels of lead in our blood came down dramatically after the banning of uh, leaded gasoline in 1976. By 1980, the levels had dropped by 90%. But we now know that there is no safe level of lead. And people are still being um, exposed. And it's a real environmental justice issue because in many of our Rust Belt cities and many older homes, there are still residues of lead paint, copper piping where the lead solder. And we know that children are still being um, exposed to lead. And we know that lead is a a has affected IQ. We know that early life exposure to lead has affected behavior. Well, guess what? It's also affecting normal growth. And here's a study looking at children in Mexico City where there is more elevated lead um, in the population. We can show that children who had higher blood lead, not at phenomenally high levels, this is actually below Never mind CDC used to have an action level of 10. They've dropped it to the 95th upper percentile and saying you should be concerned if it's over five. So this is even below five. Children who are just in that range are smaller than children who have um, less blood lead. So I think that lead continues to be an issue worldwide for sure. 
Now, I've already mentioned the issue of community engagement and how essential it is that we engage the communities with environmental health research because we need to translate the science not only by community engagement, we've got to get our health care providers on, online. We've got to get them involved in understanding the importance of environmental triggers for environmental disease. And then we've got to work with some of the policymakers that I hope you are in the audience. So in some of our community engagement, we're targeting, again, nurse and health educators, children's health advocates. Uh, I appreciate all the support we've got from a number of different professional societies. We work with different community organizations, and we work with state and local governments. So I just wanted to give a couple of community um, outreach highlights to mention. I should say that I go around the country, and I do two or three of these a year where I hold um, town hall meetings, basically, in different communities and try to understand what are the concerns of this community. So I recently held one. Uh, just about the time that Detroit announced its bankruptcy um, in Detroit. That is clearly an impacted community, um, and it was very helpful for us to hear their concerns. So, for example, I, I mentioned um, Southern California, and I, um, two years ago, visited the port, of L the port of L.A. and the port of Long Beach, and guess where the elementary schools and the middle schools are located? Right on those big highways where the trucks are idling, waiting to unload or reload from the port. And it was really interesting because one of the nurses told me anecdotally that the parents had finally gotten together and put in air filters in the schools, and the number of kids who came in with asthma attacks had dropped. But of course, the kids can't play on the playground because it, you see them there right opposite by the trucks. Um, our UC Berkeley Center has held a series of different um, outreach forms where they looked at chemicals in our environment to try to open up to the community, come and talk to us, express your concerns, and talked about the cumulative um, impacts, how they affect children. Because again, environmental exposures are complex and they're not one at a time. And these, um, th there's some recordings from these Berkeley forums that you can actually get on YouTube. Um, and you can find it that way. Don't ask me how, ask my grandson, he'll tell you. But <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, as we go forward, I think is one of the most important things. Where are we going with our next generation of children's centers? We really want to continue to strengthen and support this network of centers and strengthen the basic science. We've got to maintain our emphasis on getting the word out and translating the science into prevention. Um, we want to continue to train not only the next generation, but to change the, train the health care providers and educators. And we need to continue to involve more and more community um, partnerships as well. But we're not doing what we were 15 years ago. Science has moved on. And we're beginning to look at some of the new issues. I mentioned the microbiome a little while ago. I didn't mention epigenetics. Epigenetics is really where I think for environmental health where the rubber hits the road. Because what Epigenetics is the modifications um, of DNA and the chromosomes that control how genes are turned on and off, and that's exactly what your environment is doing. It's altering what genes are turned on when and how. Um, so that's a whole new field. We're looking at all the different omics. I said epigenetics, but it's also epigenomics, which is the broader field. We also have exposomics and proteomics and metabolomics and lipidomics and exomics. Anyway, omics just means a broad approach, the totality of something that you're looking at. So, and, and then another thing that we're doing is we're saying, you know, let's try to understand rather than sometimes the individual little steps that occurs, let's look for the pathways that are impacted because that may give us a better handle on how we can understand the relationships between exposures um, and disease. And we're also looking at the um, development of new technologies. Now, anybody who thinks biomarkers of disease or exposure is, an, is new, I don't know where you've been for the last 20 to 30 years, but the point is we have new ways to develop biomarkers. We have different biomarkers, and we need to be um, developing them. And we also need to develop more environmental sensors that will tell us from an external point of view what it is that we're, we're things. So uh, thank you very much, for all of you, for being here. And I'm really excited to hear our grantees talk about the exciting work that's going on in their centers. Thank you. Thank you.